Hi everyone, thank you so much for joining us today. Today's webinar will be about exploring mark making and rendering styles in digital art presented by Kiron Fan. Before we begin the webinar, there are some housekeeping items that I would like to go through. The webinar will be approximately one hour long. All attendees will be muted. Question and answer session will be during the last 15 minutes of the webinar. Attendees can ask questions in the Go to Webinar question box right away. Due to time constraints, not all the questions will be answered. This webinar will be recorded and the recording will be shared on social media and will be sent via email to all registrants and attendees. The panelists for this webinar are Mari Quinones, myself, and Kiron Fan. For those of you who connect with us for the very first time or have never heard about Clip Studio Paint, Clip Studio Paint is your all-in-one solution for stunning, ready-to-publish illustrations, comics, manga, and animations. Learn more at clipstudio.net forward slash and graphicsly.com. Also, don't forget uh, to tag us in your Instagram stories as hashtag webinar at subakai at graphicslim at wacom and at Cliff Studio Paint. Kiro Fun. Um, All right, so. Uh starting now uh, let me just quickly read your uh, biography oh, okay. Kieran, Kieran is a freelance artist and a student who has studied art and design academically for over five years throughout his personal work he has cycled through many styles of rendering and is always looking for exciting new ways of making art in his free time he enjoys going for walks petting cats and practicing martial arts so with that, I will leave you with Kiran and his presentation, Exploring Mark Making and Rendering Styles in Digital Art. Thank you so much. All right. Um, so, well, okay, I have like a little, oh, let me just show my, is the screen showing? Yes, perfect. Okay, yeah, so um, first I was going to just kind of talk about myself a little bit, but um, I, that's already been done, so I think that we don't have to do that. Um, as he said, my name is Kieran. Currently, I'm an art student, but I also do some freelance work. And I've been using Clip Studio Paint for over five years now. <clears throat> and uh, during this time, I kind of like to experiment a lot with um, the different types of brushes and, and styles that are attainable through digital art, because um, the, the thing about digital art is that it's sort of like this amalgamation of like um, every possible traditional style can potentially be achieved through digital art without the usual constraints. So for example, like you can get an oil painting look without the constraints of color mixing or like long drying times or setup or like, you know, turpentine that kind of thing. And you can also get a lot of like really interesting um, mixed media effects. So you can combine like oil painting look with uh, something more like cartoon animation, right? With like hard lines and flat colors. And so um, as I said before, I've been kind of semi-academically trained. Uh, I went to art school for, um, most of my, uh, I, I want to say like adult life now at this point. And I've done a lot of fine art study and painting and uh, traditional work before I got into digital. And um, for a long time, I was sort of not really interested in digital work because I felt like it couldn't really create, it was too smooth for me and I couldn't really like um, play with it the same way you can play with traditional works. Um, but 
the thing is that's that's not entirely true well there isn't really like this tactile effect of physical texture you can create a texture on the screen that can be very easily shared with other people so for example um with traditional work we have this concept of the original right so we have like your painting and then any image of the painting that gets posted online or shared or whatever, it's recognized that that's a reproduction of the image and that um, the value in itself is of the physical copy. So in order to like, I don't know, get the, the full experience, you'd have to go to a museum and you have to look at the physical thing. But luckily with digital art, we don't, that's not really the case anymore. Whatever I make on my screen can basically be the same thing on any other screen. It can even look better when viewed on a larger screen than the one I'm drawing on. Or it can maybe change the way it's perceived based on like how it's presented on a phone screen. So that's the cool thing about digital work is that you can like create these semi-traditional appearances, but um, have that digital context. So today I'm going to sort of just be covering basically um, a couple different types of brushes and how they can be used digitally and then like uh, the benefits and drawbacks for different kinds of brushes. And I'll also be talking a little bit about um, digital painting or drawing processes, a couple of most of which I've uh, used in the past and maybe like you know, the, the effect that um, changing your process can have on changing your style or how your work is perceived. So first, let's just make a quick new demo file. So um, if you open Clip Studio Paint in default, mine is a bit customized, but as you can see, there's these different like icons right here. And so you have this one that looks kind of like a fountain pen, this one that looks like a brush. And then if I switch to like, I don't know, this, that's a pencil. Um, so the thing about digital brushes is that while we do have these designations for pen, pencil, brush, and then I think this is like oil brush, paint brush, um, they can all be customized to the level where they basically can do like the same thing. Um, so for example, Right here, this is the G pen. So this pen has a circular edge, right? And it creates like this flat color. But if you look towards the end, it does actually have a bit of a gradient. Um, and if we turn off this feature called anti-aliasing, that, that will go away. So again, right here in the, I, want, I think it's like the properties panel for the G pen. You have this thing that's called anti-aliasing. So the further you get towards here, it has more of this blurred edge. And then here, we can almost have like a pixel brush. Um, and that can be really interesting depending on what you're going for. We also, um, I don't know if I open up like a sub window if it can be seen. Like, can you guys see? Uh, okay, so like here, we can change the, uh, the dynamics of the brush. So right now, it has pen pressure turned off. So it doesn't taper at the end. It's a circle when it starts and it's a circle where it ends, like regardless of how hard you push down. But if I tap this little thing that turns on the pen pressure sensitivity, it tapers depending on the pressure you apply. We can also play with the curve right here. So under this, you can change how the taper works. So like now it's a little bit more wacky, right? It's a little bit more unpredictable because I it's not just a clear um, like linear curve or whatever. And you can also turn on velocity. So it, it changes depending on like how slow or fast you go. The benefit of using the pen tools I, is that it creates this nice hard line, which is really easy to use tools like the fill bucket on. So like here, even though there is this sort of line, if 
if I uh, make a new layer for the filling. And let's change the color to something random. It'll fill up to the line. Um, and we can change that around here by adjusting the tolerance of the area scaling. So if I have the area scaling at a negative number, it'll automatically have this eight pixel buffer between what I fill in the line. And if I change it to an extremely positive number, it should fill past the line. Um, so if I remove this, you can see that, let's change the opacity here. We can see that it's filled all the way up to the edge of this line. We can also play with this uh, thing called tolerance right here. So, oops, let me zoom out a bit. This tolerance controls um, the the number of like colors that the fill bucket considers to be its own. So, to have an example of that, like, I don't know, let me just pull up some other drawing that I've done, right? Like this one. If I wanted to use the fill bucket on this for whatever reason, I will say I want to fill in this shape. This isn't all one color. So if I just push this fill bucket, it just kind of like fills in a pixel or so. Or it does. I don't know why it's, it's not working. Hmm. should fill in a pixel <laughs> if I try it somewhere else. Okay, like, all right, well, actually, I don't really know what's going on there. But um, going back to this one then, like, if we had a brush with, say, some kind of like gradient, so like some of this is gray and some of that's black, and we wanted to fill it in, If we wanted to fill it in and we turn the tolerance down to zero, see how it only fills in that specific color. But if we turn it up a little bit, it'll start recognizing more varieties of gray or like hues as its own. So if you uh, turn it like really high, 100, it's just gonna fill everything in because it's gonna see all that as like one fillable color. Uh, but that was just a little bit of a, a tangent about the um, the pen tool. If you're doing something like animation um, and you need to just kind of like fill in a lot of stuff really quickly, then it helps to be able to use a tool where the fill bucket is going to recognize it very easily. So this is an animation um, that I did earlier this week. There's the timeline palette. I don't know why it's playing so weirdly, but um, anyways, each frame needs to be filled in, right? So um, you can kind of achieve like a quicker sketch with the pen tool. I also like to use the pen tool for anything that's kind of more of a doodle or like manga type quality especially if the pressure sensitivity is turned off. Because what I find is that if you turn off the pressure sensitivity, it makes it a lot easier and quicker to draw with the brush. Um, and that's partly because you're not really, you don't have to worry about like this taper so much. So like, let's say I'm drawing, um, I don't know, let's just do like a quick figure for a demonstration. This is with the pressure sensitivity turned on. And the ends of the lines are a little bit like harder to control here. Right. But if I turn the pressure sensitivity off, usually I feel like um, it can look messier, but that's good because if it's messier, then it's less noticeable when, when there's like a difference in line quality so for something like a comic or like an animation i'll typically turn off the pressure sensitivity and i'll just draw with it almost like um 
like I'm sketching, right? Okay, so with paint, paintbrushes are a little bit different. Paintbrushes, this is the one I use a lot. It's just titled Smooth Watercolor. As you can see, there's a little bit of a ripple effect here. So like the, the way that these brushes work, I believe, is that there's a specific shape as the tip, and that shape repeats itself throughout the brush. So you can actually change that if you want. You can, you can change the um, distance between the strokes. So here, this is a little bit clearer. There's less of this like jitter going on. There's less of this repetition. But on brushes where it's very extreme, like um, I can make it extreme on a different brush. Like I can just turn this gap up. So now this gap is, is very wide and you can change it to be more of an even stroke. But I typically like to play with brushes that have a sort of like wide-ish gap just because it gives it sort of like this texture to it that um, if it's if it's too smooth, you're not gonna have that. And I find texture to be very visually interesting, especially with digital art, because a lot of people don't typically expect to see it. Um, and it gives it sort of like this traditional charm to it. So you can do a lot of different things with the paint brushes. If you are looking for a very rendered appearance, um, you might want to stick to like very smooth brushes because they're going to give you very nice gradients. Um, but if you want like, see if I have different examples in my work. So this is like a painting, um, or some. So this one, for example, that I'm working on right now, this, this piece isn't finished. Uh, it hopefully doesn't crash the stream because it's way too big. Just give it a, a second to, to load up. OK, so here, as you can see, The color mixing isn't made up of individual strokes of different color that blend together, but rather like more of a gradient of color. So if you look at his face, for example, this value is different from this value in hue. This is more saturated and it's and, uh, darker a little bit. Um, but it's not because they're different strokes. They're within like sort of the same mass but they're different whereas there's other ways to do it like for example here this is a lot of optical mixing so um the the colors and values are more determined by the stroke that they came from rather than like multiple uh colors and values contained in the same stroke so there's different benefits to why you might want to do something like this where it's broken up a lot or why you might want to do something that's a little more rendered. Um, if something is more rendered, then we tend to see it not as a complete image made up of a bunch of different strokes, but rather um, several objects that are, are clearly separated sort of like combining into a single piece. And what that does is that it allows us to be able to like edit things um, based off of uh, like where they are. So you could paint like a separate arm, for example, and then just edit the arm and not the entire body by putting it on a different layer. Personally, I've been really into work recently that like is composed of many different strokes because what that does is it allows me to see the entire composition as a full image rather than here's the figure, here's the background, here's another figure, and they're all in different layers. Um, there's a there 
there's nothing wrong with doing that, but um, typically when you think about composition, you kind of want to create an image where the figure and the background um, have sort of this, what we call figure ground relationship. So they, it, it's less of a PNG on a backdrop and more of like an incorporated background. And you can still have varying levels of um, detail in the figure and the background. But if you plan your composition initially as a whole, rather than drawing the figure first and then the background, um, I find that it's a lot easier to come up with like a very cohesive image. So I'm gonna, okay, so I think I spent a little too much time on that. Uh, what else do I need to talk about? Right, okay, so um, with any kind of image, there are hard and soft edges. So the way you pick your brushes is gonna basically be determined on whether or not you want hard edges or soft edges. So if you only painted with soft edges, in life, there aren't really a lot of hard outlines that you can see with your own eyes. That's not really how things work. But we still kind of wanna paint with outlines and um, edges because if we don't and we're just like manipulating i don't know gradients and, and stuff then suddenly everything becomes foggy and blurry and um there's nothing really interesting to look at because it all gets immediately lost however if i just uh i don't know have a gradient like this and then suddenly this is a little more interesting to look at because there's this stark contrast between this hard edge and this soft edge right here. So a lot of shadows, they have a hard edge and a soft edge. There's form shadow. Um, so I don't know, let's just use like a basic sphere as an example. That is a pretty ugly example. Um, oh, we can just use the ellipse tool. So here's our sphere. And we want our sphere to, let's just like block it in somehow. Okay. So our sphere is gonna cast a shadow on the ground. Typically, so there's two kinds of shadows, right? There's this cast shadow that the sphere is physically placing. And then there's the form shadow, which is the shading along the sphere itself. So on a round object like this, this form shadow is very, it's very soft. This is not how you should shade a sphere, but um, this is just my example for now. It's very impromptu. So if we follow this rule of like cast shadows typically having hard edges and form shadows having soft edges, then we can start to create more believable rendering in our work. A typical cast shadow that you might see is underneath someone's neck, right? So like that's the cast shadow from the head casting onto the neck. And here we have light coming in through the side and there's room light, but there's also a little bit of cast shadow like with the um, stockings, for example. But if you look at the form, maybe this isn't the best idea, the best example because um, I drew this a while ago, but here there's a there's a bit of a cast shadow because there's an edge, right? But if you blend it out, it has a different effect. 
typically I try to stay away from using all hard edges or all round edges to define a form. I think that what what's really interesting to look at is if you manage to find like a mix of the two, right? So like, I don't know, if we look at this drawing, there's hard edges, but there's also soft edges. And so by using both of those, um, you don't have to like do it super scientifically if you don't want to. You can almost kind of just guess or play around with it. But just using both of those tools is going to have a very interesting look. So here we have like the tights, right? So these are going to be, these are very soft. So you want like the soft edge. But then on something like the armor, there's more of these angular hard edges. So when you zoom out, you can kind of see a little bit of texture. Um, about digital, I'm going to move on to talking a little bit about like digital processes and uh, different ways you can like approach painting. So let's go back to let's go back to the spheres, right? A lot of the time with professional illustration, you'll see very highly rendered works where every individual um, form or shape is separated out into a different layer. And there's a bit of a consistency in, in brush stroke that you can make with these shapes. Different artists have their own ways of doing that. <clears throat> One way is this physical like brush stroke type of uh, work that I'm doing right now. Another way is you can actually use this lasso tool, for example, and you can even like apply gradients um, like that, or you can use an extremely soft brush like this airbrush. You can create entire images just like this, but um, and the the pros are that it's very clean looking, um, typically very professional. There's a lot of separation between the shape and form, and if you're really like getting into it and you really wanted to like shade extremely well, you would have your light source and you can almost like ray trace and map and figure out you know if the light source is like where the shadow is going to be cast and you can have a very scientifically composed image that reacts in the way that light should um but because of this it can be a very time consuming process and when you work like this you typically want to work in layers because you'll have you know, you'll have your base layer with like the object and then you'll have like the shading layer. And then any other effects you want, you'd have to, to factor that in as well. So you might have like, I don't know, a layer that makes use of different setting like overlay, right? So now this is the light and you have this one set to multiply. So if you're gonna work like that, you kind of want to keep really good track of your layers because the whole point is that if you render the object and then you shade it separately on different layers, um, you should be able to very easily, like maybe by changing the opacity of those layers or <clears throat> the layer mode, easily edit specific parts of the lighting to suit what you're going for. The problem here is that the, the base layer with the object doesn't contain all that lighting. So you would have to edit that minus all the lighting if you wanted to change you know, what it looked like. And you'd have to keep track of all those things. Um, then there's, there's cell shading, which you may have heard of before. So this is a very messy example because I, I didn't exactly color within the lines here. But it's very similar in that you're you're shading on different layers and you're 
you know, applying lighting onto an unrendered object. But the difference is that you t there's typically more um, hard outline, hard edge. I usually don't cell shade a lot of my work. It would probably be the thing that I do the least, just because <clears throat> it's deceptively difficult. So in a painting like this, where it's made up of different strokes, if there's a stroke that's somewhat out of place, like here, it kind of trails off. Well, firstly, it can be stylistic, but also when there's so many strokes, you don't notice things like um, mistakes or inconsistencies. But the cleaner you go for, and like the more um, tight and controlled the lines are, the uh, the 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 more noticeable it will be when there is an error. And right now, I don't really think I have like the cleanest line work on its own. So I try to stay away from that type of shading. It does have its benefits. So for example, um, if you're using flat colors, it could potentially be a very fast process. And it's very easy for something like printing. So um, let's say you're printing and you have like a limited palette. You might not be able to get in all the different types of gradients, but um, you know, like it, you can make things like t-shirt designs or four color prints using this kind of technique. It, it's just that here, in order for the, um, the, the fill bucket to, to work effectively and stuff, you actually need to have like these closed lines and clear shapes and like separate colors on different layers. And that can be a lot to deal with sometimes. And the, the last like big process that I wanna talk about, one that I've probably do the most is uh, painting more or less with like brushwork, right? So I'm gonna try to find some like nice process images or we can just paint something new right now. But you don't, have to do everything with like a sketch phase and then like a rendering phase um, and then like lighting. A lot of paintings that I do, I actually only use one layer at a time. And any other layer is just sort of like an edit over to, to um, like a different version. So on this, let's take a look at this maid that I recently painted. And let's put all these layers in a folder so I can get them out of the way for now. There's a lot of different layer versions right here. So this is kind of like the sketch and it's made up of a bunch of different strokes. I'm not really trying to like, um, I'm not really trying to like render out specific shapes yet, just more or less testing the placement of different like lights and values and colors to see how it looks together as an image. So when it's zoomed out, you know, can you still kind of see what it's supposed to be? Or is it somewhat confusing? Does it maintain like the perspective and the, the look that I'm going for? Or does it look too flat? So this is all painted on one layer. And when I make a new layer, I'll duplicate it. And then I'll make any edits I wanna make on the new one. working. Uh, okay. Why isn't okay, so like 
there's sort of this progression now. And then this is like a big shift. I changed the direction of her gaze and I also kind of changed like the, the general proportions and style of it. And I'm kind of just chipping away at it layer by layer. So here, um, I made an adjustment to the entire thing by using the color balance tool. So I believe I just increased the yellow value and it kind of made it more like this. So there are a lot of layers involved in these types of paintings for me, but they're pretty much just duplicates of layers with separate edits on them. So I, I have a lot of layers, but it's not like there's a specific layer for the um, eye and there's a specific layer for the, the body. It's all one image. In a very complicated piece like this, with multiple characters. I'm gonna have to close some of these other tabs because it might crash my computer. Yeah, I'm gonna have to close some of these out. Okay, in a complicated piece like this, I'm still painting on one layer. It's just that the, um, the elements are on different ones. So like, I'm treating this as kind of multiple paintings, so to speak. So each character is on their own layer, but within those layers, I'm not really like, there's no character, there's no layer for his head and then there's no layer for like his arm. And it makes it a little bit more difficult to edit, but it also makes it easier for me to just keep track of what's going on. Because I find that if I have too many layers and I forget to name them, it's really easy to get lost and not really know what's going on anymore to the point where if you're not going back and using layers actively to edit them, you might as well just merge because then it makes it easier to, to see what's happening. Um, but here, like I do still want to have these on separate layers because it lets me really easily, you know, like I can move him around if I want. I can nudge characters in like different places and see what happens, how that changes the composition. The thing about these different types of processes is that different artists will develop them at, at different levels. So I am aware of other drawing processes and their existence and like how they work, but because I haven't really practiced them, too much myself, I can't really like, I, I don't feel like I have mastery over it. But the thing is when you're starting digital art or even like if you're just looking for a change, there's so many different ways you can do things that I would not stop after just like maybe one tutorial about a specific artist process. I I think that if you're having a very hard time with a very trying to capture a very specific style, it's totally okay to just say, you know what, that might not be for me. Like cell shading, you know, I just I just don't think it's for me personally because it doesn't work. But there's so many different ways to create digital art that I don't necessarily need it. I can find something else that I really like to do instead. Um, one of those things was sort of like this uh, almost semi-traditional. Um, so here I'm using cross hatching alongside like, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a very traditional style technique, but luckily with digital art, it can be used with color too. So. This is a technique that I did a lot last year. And I think that in terms of mastery, 
I probably have the most experience with this over other types, but I don't feel as inclined to draw like it as much recently, just because it's very time consuming and it gets a little bit boring. And for me at the end of the day, um, I care just as much about the process of making something as I do about the finished result. So if I don't have fun while I'm making a drawing, then I would rather just not do it at all. I, I don't make the drawing because I wanna see the finished result of a specific way. I just want to have fun while I'm doing it. And that's sort of the ethos why I like to experiment and play around with a lot of different types of digital art and rendering. Um, not because I wanna find something specifically that like I'm gonna be really good at, but also just because it's fun. And I, I really think that it's a medium that you can combine and find new ways to express yourself beyond what other people are already doing. So maybe you want to like do a piece where one figure is cell shaded and the other one is painted in you know, how will the contrast of that play out? How will that affect your work? Um, I think that by combining existing styles, you can kind of like find new things that work for you. You know, I took lessons about lighting and like mark making away from, from this cross hatching style that I now apply to my other work. So even if I don't draw like that all the time, this is a painting, right? But I feel like I've taken lessons away from that and applied it to the hair here. And you can kind of just changing, you know, your brush will really change the way you, you think about art because um, here, you know, there's a lot of this cross hatching going on and the hatching follows the direction of the piece. And I still, even in works that are, are done completely differently with different brushes, I still apply some of those principles there, here and there. And with digital, you know, you can have these um, really like traditional style brushwork combined with things that those types of brushes really cannot do in real life. Like with watercolor, for example, you pretty much have to work light to dark. It's a subtractive color mixing medium. So like when you layer with watercolor, it gets darker. You can't layer and get lighter, but you can with digital watercolor. And that's the type of mark making that I find really interesting. And that's sort of what the point of this webinar is for me. It's not necessarily to like show a very specific process or how to steps. But I kind of just want anyone who watches this to be encouraged to really experiment and try new things with the amount of brushes they have. Um, you can sometimes like when I'm bored with a brush, I don't know, this brush, for example, I can change just by just by changing, you know, something like this it becomes a different brush. And then you can take things that you like about a brush, keep them and then change the rest. So for example, here's a default brush from Clip Studio Paint that I, I use a lot. And I like it because it has this watercolor edge effect that you can turn on and off and you can like change the size of it. But sometimes I'm not really like too fond of this big square ending to it. So you can actually go in and like change the shape of the brush tip. So I don't know, here's a Pentagon tip, right? So like now I'm not gonna have the problem of like it being a square anymore. Or you can, uh, you can take, you can steal a brush tip from like, I don't know, something else and then change it. This tip I'm using right now is a PNG of like a blade of grass. But already it's doing really interesting things. And even though it's just a demo right now, I'm I'm actually, I might experiment with this later because see, it has like this hard edge and then it tapers out. It's really cool. When we think of digital art style, usually the first things that come to mind are 
certain ways someone proportions their characters. So like when you think of, I don't know, anime style, you typically think, oh, well, you know, there's less defined definition on the nose and like the eyes are a certain shape and um, the like head to body ratio is a certain thing way. And that's, that is an aspect of style. But style has other factors too. One, one could literally just be like subject matter. So if you draw a lot of fantasy stuff, even if you're doing it differently uh, from piece to piece, there's still like, that's still incorporated within your style. It's, it's how you choose to express your art. But the brushes that we use can have just as much of an effect on your style. Um, it, it has a little bit to do with like, not what you're making, but how you're doing it. And even if you study a lot of, um, I don't know, very specific technical things like lighting, anatomy, those are objective things to study. Those, those have an objective, correct way that they behave across the board. And how you want to stylize the proportion of that and like accuracy of that is up to you, right? So yeah, there's an objective anatomy and then objective proportions, but you can style that however you want. There is not an objective answer to mark making. There, there isn't like, uh, unless you're like, even if you're just looking at, I don't know, pixels on a screen, right? Like there's no objective way in which an image forms itself unless you're like drawing individual molecules. But even if you were to draw molecules, right? How are you drawing them? Are you putting them like down on a, a big black like sheet and then erasing them out? Or are you adding them in? You know, uh, are, you, are you drawing the outlines? There's, there isn't really an objective answer to that. So that's something that I think is really cool about art in general. You can take things that people have seen before and by trying to push yourself to change the, um, the way in which you make them, you can kind of create new, new types of art and like recontextualize it. So, you know, don't just look at um, other digital artists. Sometimes it's nice to look at traditional artists and, and, and think, you know, What's, uh, what's something cool that this painter does? How can I incorporate it into the, my work? And also, where, where are they being limited by their medium? So if you look at like a lot of oil painters, um, you can kind of figure out like what aspects of the painting are because um, that's how they want to paint and what aspects are working around the constraints of their medium. And even by having constraints, you can create really cool styles too, because um, if you limit yourself in specific ways, it causes you to be more creative in other ways. Um, creativity is sort of like a problem solving skill, right? So if um, you give yourself more problems to solve, you might come up with really creative and interesting solutions. And that's why if there's one thing to take away from this webinar, I know I didn't really get to do any demoing or, or anything, but I, I sort of just want to encourage anyone who watches this to go out and explore and find their own way to make digital art. Um, it's 2.53, so is there, uh, I guess we can start answering some questions now, if there's time. Yes, thank you so much, Kieran. This has been an amazing webinar. Uh, everybody loved it. Uh, I'm really excited with your presentation. Okay, because so, I couldn't see any of the feedback in real time. Yeah, so. no, seriously, there, there are tons of questions. Most of them regard uh, related to um, uh, brushes. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so okay. So we'll get to that point. Uh, at, at the start of the webinar, we ask uh, from where, are, uh, which part of the planet where are you watching us? Uh, so there are many people from France, Norway, Chile, Hungary, oh, wow. Wow. Colombia, P -p 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 Tunisia, Dubai, United States, 
Portugal, Slovakia, t -t 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 Germany, etc., etc. So thank you so much, all of you who join us. Um, so let's start with some questions. Um, I really like wide question is like, uh, where do you get your brushes? Do you make them? Do you download them? Do you pay for your brushes? Oh, okay. So um, for a very long time, I literally only used the brushes that came default with Clip Studio Paint. Uh, like this is like my earlier work. This was done entirely with uh, this flat watercolor brush that came with Clip Studio. And right here, these are like my main brushes, as you can see, that I just found that I consistently like. And two of them, actually three of them, are, are Clip Studio paint brushes. So if you want to get more brushes, uh, I've never paid for brushes in my life. I either get them for free off of the Clip Studio asset store, um, kind of like this pen I was demoing earlier, uh, I got for free from like some Japanese user on the asset store and I just turned off the pressure sensitivity on it. Um, and I also just get like, I just get brushes whenever I can. So, you know, if I have a friend or something who's got like Photoshop brushes, I'll just kind of yoink them. But uh, I don't have any specific like file folders or brush packs I can share. Um, I would just try to like mess around, mess around with brushes and you can like really duplicate uh, some of the existing brushes and just screw around with their properties and you might end up creating something unique to you and then you'll be the only person with that brush. So yeah. <laughs> and another question from Gabriela. She says, uh, where do you get your inspiration from? Do you use sites like Pinterest or post references or backgrounds? Yeah, okay, so I, I do use Pinterest a lot for like, um, general, I want to say like compositional reference. If I'm drawing a specific character, uh, uh, my inspiration comes from just like, you know, my love for whatever game or show that they're coming from. And um, I try to think about things that I enjoy looking at and just draw those. Um, so I think that art should be genuine and genuinely fun to do. If what's genuinely fun for you to draw is like, I don't know, anime women with large breasts, you shouldn't be ashamed of that. You should you should really lean into it and you should draw the best anime women with large breasts that you possibly can. Um, I think that inspiration can really be found anywhere though. So for poses, I usually try not to draw poses that I've already drawn just because it's a little boring for me. It does help to have a solid understanding of anatomy because it'll increase the number of types of poses you can try to do and you can also like look at your favorite artists and just see what they're doing and try to do similar things or like combine stuff with poses specifically if there's a pose that you really like but you don't want to draw it again you can just draw it from a different angle so that's another interesting thing you can try mm -hmm. Another question that many people asked is like Harry, he says, how long typically per day do you draw or how long does an artwork take you to finish? Hmm. Well, for the first question, in a perfect world, I would love to draw like all day. And there have been times when I've been able to draw all day. But, you know, the thing about life is that nowadays the, the amount of time I spend per day kind of varies. It's usually from like four to eight hours. Um, eight hours would be like a good day. Four would be, I had like a couple of errands to run or something. The, the same kind of goes for like how long it takes to finish a work. Some it depends on the, the context of it or like what I'm, what I'm trying to do. So if it's like, if I have a lot of time and I don't have a lot of pressure to move on to the next project, I will probably spend as long as I can on it, maybe about like 10 hours. A painting like this took around, um, I want to say six hours to complete. And this was very low pressure for me. I didn't really have anything else to work on at the time. Whereas 
this drawing I had to finish within a couple of days for an assignment. And um, that took me about, well, actually, I think this one took about six hours as well, but I was just drawing the entire time. Um, I, I would not approach painting or drawing with the mindset of, I need to put in X amount of hours before it can be complete, because you'll find that as you draw more, you'll probably be a lot faster than you think. And sometimes spending less time on something is better because um, you, you get to capture the initial impression of it instead of like over rendering or overdoing something. And also, oh, before I forget, before I forget to show the textures panel in Clip Studio Paint is really cool. You've got all these textures and they can drastically change what your painting looks like. So um, I was going to go over this in the initial presentation, but I just forgot to. Textures, you, you can import them like this and then you go into layer properties, texture combine. And so like the way you ch choose the texture can actually really change something up. So if you want to just like completely change your drawing, but not redraw the whole thing, you can try putting a texture on and you can change the opacity. You can change the opacity of the texture and you can also change the layer mode of it. And those will just play around with that. And it's kind of cool. Uh, sorry about that. Any other questions? Yes, another very interesting from Carolina Stanchikova. Sorry if I pronounced it wrong. <laughs> what motivates you to keep drawing? Um, I, I really like learning a skill. So going back to like the, the process of it, I don't really draw as much with the intention of there's a goal I want to attain. Like I don't draw with the goal of a specific studio I want to work at or a specific piece I want to make. Um, I think that for me, art is like a means to an end. So, sorry, it's not a means to an end. It is the means itself. Um, I just like playing around with different things and like the active process of creating is kind of relaxing and it helps me focus on something singular. And uh, I like that feeling of improvement. So I guess my motivation would be to continue to improve and make art that I can be proud of. Mm -hmm. Another question from Leonardo says, uh, do you always uh, paint uh, with 600 DPI? What's the size of your canvas you regularly use? Um, this one's 300 DPI. Recently, I've been using 600, uh, not for any particular reason, but I don't go below 300 just because I want to make sure if I wanted to, I could print any of these things out. Um, on Clip Studio right here, this little square symbol, it will resize your screen so that you're a hundred percent. So like, this is a hundred percent the size of this. And if I kind of like imagine the size of this object compared to my hand, if I'm drawing like something that's poster size, um, I just want my drawing to be the size that it would be presentable at. Typically, I don't go below three thousand pixels in any dimension. Because uh, I do like to go into detail on like the face, for example. So here at 100%, I, I feel like I have enough space to like render out the face still. Mm -hmm. And uh, another question from Anna Drake. Uh, could we see more of your steps and work in progress shots? You could just share another file because it, that was really yeah. interesting. A lot of people like to see your process and steps. Yeah, okay, let me, I'm gonna try to find one. So, okay, so there's there's this one. This one was pretty well documented. So this stage is sort of like starting out with line work and um, planning the composition overall. And then there I'll block in like, uh, I'll, I'll block in all the individual like characters onto separate layers. And then, shoot, where's the second, second picture? And then I'll like, for this one, I just kind of gradually like um, did each character one by one. And then 
uh, actually, with, this is one of the pieces where I started out with um, Coop Studio 3D tools. Unfortunately, their proportions weren't really what I was looking for, but this was just a valuable way for me to like plan out the angle and composition of it. And then I didn't really trace over them, but I kind of, I, I definitely referenced them, so. The, the, thing, the problem I think with showing my process is that it kind of changes a lot from piece to piece, depending on how I'm feeling, because for some works like uh, these fantasy pieces, you know, I wanted this sort of like Akihiko Yoshida inspired, like, uh, like almost kind of traditional look, but for something with a little more, I don't know, modernity to it, it changes and so typically I just it ends up devolving into like painting on one layer yeah and um, unfortunately we are reaching the end of our webinar but okay. before we go one last question and um, if you could just uh, share some Wise, uh, wise words of uh, knowledge about anyone who is struggling with the final look of their of their illustration. What would you say to them? So, like struggling with um, figuring out if it's done. Mm -hmm. Hmm. That's a good question. It, it, it depends because for some pieces, um, it's very easy to tell when it's done because when you start the piece you have an idea already in your head of what it should look like and it's like you you have the process all planned out but for something where when you start you're just exploring and you don't actually know what it's what the final piece is going to look like at all uh it's more about trying to find that for me a piece is done when i feel 100 comfortable with showing it to someone else but there can also just be like time constraints. Honestly, sometimes I, it's just time to move on. And even if there are things that you know could be improved or fixed, you can just work on those in the next one. And um, I, I think faster improvement actually comes from doing more pieces rather than spending way too long on a single piece. So I don't try to work on something for longer than uh, a week or a couple weeks if it's like a really big piece. Mm -hmm. But don't be afraid to take your time. Like, if if there isn't anyone specifically breathing down your neck to finish something, um, and you just won't feel comfortable until it's like completely done, just trust your intuition uh, and just don't be afraid to to take your time with it. Well, thank you so much with those wise words, uh, Kieran. Uh, we are wrapping up the webinar. Okay. Thank you so much for this thank awesome you for having presentation. Me. Uh, thank you all who joined us. Uh, we're just going to share one last bit of information. So, before we go, we just want to remind you that to learn more about Clip Studio Paint, you can visit our website clipstudio.net forward slash n and graphicsly.com. Also, this webinar is being recorded and will be uploaded to our YouTube channels, Clip Studio Paint channel and Graphicsly. So don't forget to subscribe to receive a notification once it's available to watch. And lastly, for more information about Kiron, don't forget to follow him on Instagram as Subakai, Twitter and ArtStation as Kiron Arts. So with that, once again, thank you so much, Kiron. Thank you. And thank you all who join us and we'll see you in our next webinar. So stay tuned. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.